will come straight to me here in the studio. Now, one really easy way to get your voice heard on free speech is via the power bar. There it is. It responds in real time to what you think of the panel's points of view and it operates via Twitter. So, just use hashtag yes or hashtag no, followed by the name of a panellist each time you agree or disagree with them. And here is our panel, whose first job in just one sentence is to tell us who they are and why they're here. Uh, start with you, please, Damien. I'm Damien Green. I'm the MP for Ashford in Kent. I'm the Minister for Policing and Criminal Justice, uh, and I'm here to support free speech. Mehdi? I'm Mehdi Hassan. I'm the political director of the Huffington Post UK. I'm here because I'm worried we're about to get into another mad war, and I'm here to say why I think it's a bad idea. Shami? I'm Shami Chakrabarti, and I'm the director of Liberty the National Council for Civil Liberties, this country's domestic human rights campaign. You might say that, despite being middle-aged, I'm a professional teenager. Sometimes I say to politicians, that's not fair. Sometimes I say, I hate you. Occasionally, you've ruined my life, but hopefully not too often. Milo. I'm Milo Yiannopoulos. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of The Colonel, which is an online technology, media and uh, politics publication. And I'm here to support aggressive military intervention into Syria. Seema. I'm Seema Malhotra, I'm the Labour and Cooperative Member of Parliament for Felton and Heston. I'm here because I think we do not listen to the voices of young people enough in society. Seema, we've got to go live in God, five God, seconds. seconds. The politicians, the commentators and the experts have all had their say. Tonight, for the first time, a television audience has theirs. Welcome to the Syria Crisis, a special edition of Free Speech, live on BBC Three. People are under a lot of pressure in Britain. But there's not enough grassroots work being done. What do we think about that? Should charity not start at home? But it is a big deal for them and it's very important. Make sure you've got a voice and we will listen. I'm Rick Edwards and an audience of 150 16 to 30 year olds are here in Stoke Newington Town Hall in North London. And it's the first time since the Syria crisis erupted that television is going to hear the views live of the British public. People from this area, plus young Syrians who've left their country for London, are here to tell us what they think. We want to hear what you at home think too. Just tell Tina De Healy. Thank you very much, Rick, and a very good evening to you. I want you to get online with Facebook, Twitter and the BBC so that you can shape the debate. Here are the addresses you need. I will be launching each of our questions on social media at the same time as they are live here in Stoke Newington. Your answers and comments will come straight to me here in the studio now. One really easy way to get your voice heard on free speech is via the power bar. There it is. It responds in real time to what you think of the panel's points of view and it operates via Twitter. So just use hashtag yes or hashtag no followed by the first name of a panellist each time you agree or disagree with them. And here is our panel whose first job in just one sentence is to tell us who they are and why they're here. And we'll start with you please Damien. I'm Damien Green, I'm the Member of Parliament for Ashford in Kent and the Minister for Policing and Criminal Justice. Uh, I'm here to support free speech because that's one of the key aspects of freedom in this country now and I hope eventually in Syria as well. Mehdi. I'm Mehdi Hassan, I'm the Political Director of the Huffington Post UK. I'm worried that we're about to embroil ourselves in another crazy Middle East war. I'm here to tell you why I think it's such a bad idea. Shami. My name is Shami Chakrabarti, I'm the Director of Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties, this country's domestic campaign for human rights for everybody. Milo. My name is Milo Yiannopoulos, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Colonel, an online technology, media and politics magazine, and I believe that in order to maintain free speech, um, we should go into Syria. And Seema. I'm Seema Malhotra, I'm the Labour and Cooperative Member of Parliament for Feltham and Heston. I'm here because I believe that we don't hear the voices of young people enough in society and in our politics. I think young people should have their say on matters of war and peace as well as how this country is run and I'm delighted to be here tonight. And that is your panel this evening. OK, let's get going. At least 100,000 dead, 1,429 killed in a chemical weapons attack, 426 of them children, 2 million refugees. A brutal regime is fighting a shadowy alliance of rebels, including 
elements of al-Qaeda. Here, David Cameron's attempt to launch a British military strike has been defeated. But in America, President Obama says he wants to carry out limited and targeted bombing. Suddenly, there is no shortage of news about Syria. One of the most abhorrent uses of chemical weapons in a century. This menace must be confronted. I strongly believe in the need for a tough response to the use of chemical weapons. I happen to think that we've got to assess the evidence over the coming period. MPs are voting now on whether Britain should, in principle, back a military strike against Syria. The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 285. Yeah! feel like some sort of not even a second class citizen like like we don't we just don't matter the whole world has failed our nation and Kimberly has a question where's Kimberly what would you like to ask do you think Parliament were right to vote against military action okay uh, let's start with you please Seema what's your answer to that I happen to think that the vote was right last week. I do not think that we were ready to make a decision about going to war uh, in that way in this country. To have a decision like that made with MPs recalled, some still jet lagged coming back from wherever they were across the world, to make a decision without putting the evidence even in front of MPs, let alone in front of the public, to have evidence that was just dripping through in the day, to have a decision about war made when you don't even have a process for peace underway, to make a decision unilaterally without actually going through international institutions. You know, this is a country that is still in the legacy of Iraq, not because Iraq and Syria were the same, because they weren't. However, we know that we have to do something about Syria. What we cannot do is repeat the mistakes of the past, making a decision without getting international support, making a decision without making the case to the British people and allowing them to have their say in a way that a matter of this importance absolutely deserves. And do you agree with that, Milo? No, and I think it's quite disturbing and irresponsible, actually. Um, it's very clear, as you said, that we have to do something about Syria. This was a vote on principle. It wasn't a vote that, that the result of which was going to directly lead to, it, to military intervention. I don't entirely believe a lot of Labour MPs when they talk on this subject. I think you know, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of them are in a very difficult position. Um, it's been created by their, their leader, which is you know, a horrible political posturing that has not only um, cost... Uh, democracy, it has lowered the standing of, of this country internationally, but more important than that, it's actually, called, it's actually um, contributed to the humanitarian crisis in Syria. And it's, you know, we're standing by allowing the situation to get worse when we should be making a stand against somebody who's using chemical weapons on his own people, a, a red line that should never be crossed. Um, and by sitting by and allowing him to do that to his own people, I mean, the, the level of inhumanity and, and, uh, and, and uh, disreputableness from Labour is really shocking to me. So two very differing points of view there. Who, yes, what would you say to that, sir? I'd like to address the fact that no one seems to say anything when Israel is assumed to be using white phosphorus in Palestinians. <laughs> but we must be making the news. I think it's really important there is an intervention. But it's almost as if this country only understands military intervention. What I would like to know is... Is there any financial gain for this country by going to war? If so, and if the reasons for going to war are financial, then we should stay out of Syria. So, Damien, I guess you're best place to answer that. As um, a of the government. I rather agree with, with, with what Milo said. Uh, the, I mean, the first thing is uh, that, I mean, this, this is not about money or, or, or making money. It's about a government in Syria that bombs its own people with chemical weapons which have been illegal for nearly a hundred years since the First World War because they are uniquely horrible and for a country to do that against its own people is therefore uniquely disgusting 
and the rest of the world needs to do something about it. Now, Parliament decided what it did. Seema voted one way. I, I voted the other way, because I think, it, as, as Milo said, it was only on the principle. We weren't saying we are going to drop bombs on Syria. We were going to say the principle of military intervention should be left open. Uh, Parliament has decided against that, so we'll have to do other things. And we are doing other things uh, in the diplomatic sphere. And mostly, we're helping, uh, m almost more than any other country, some of the two million refugees that have been forced out of their own country and are now living in misery uh, on the Syrian border. So even after that vote, there's a lot that Britain can do and is doing to try and relieve some of the misery of this terrible situation. Uh, yeah, quick comment from this lady here, please. Okay, um, I first of all disagree with your statement that it's not a financial gain to actually invade into Syria, because if it was purely on humanitarian reasons, why wasn't there intervention in the Congo, in Rwanda? First of all, war and conflict is a business, first of all. To even fund it, it is a business. So if there isn't any sort of financial gain, why is it that we didn't intervene in previous wars? And why are we being kept in the dark about our gain of what we, like, what we would gain from actually going into Syria? Why are we being kept in the dark as a society? OK, so obviously this is uh, getting people going. Are, are people similarly engaged yeah, online, Tina? getting people going online all week. We've had a huge response, thousands of messages coming in. So we've been asking, is it ever right for the UK to intervene in other countries in conflict? Kerry says, and we're talking about military intervention, Kerry says, yes, it is, but we need a proper plan and the best evidence we can get. Melissa disagrees and says, we have in the past and naffed it up each and every time, so no. And this point from Craig, who says... So we're not talking about financial gain here, but when it threatens our national and international security, yes, it is right. The government has a responsibility to safeguard Britain. So the question is, is Syria a threat to us? Uh, Kimberley's original question was, was Parliament right to vote against military intervention? What do you think, Shami? I think um, I'll give due credit to the Prime Minister for actually going to Parliament at all. Um, um, because you do put yourself on the line as a Prime Minister when you have a vote like that. Uh, what I would say is it would now be a mistake for him to say, you've had your chance and I'm never coming back to Parliament. I think let's not, let's not be silly about this. If this is really about the evidence and it's really about saving lives and the, the picture evolves, I don't think that the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister or anybody else should rule out going back. I think that there's posturing on both sides and, and I understand why, because this is a really emotional subject. This is life and death and war and peace. But I actually think that the, the, the people who've spoken from the audience and, and some of the people that have, that have tweeted and so on are actually not that far apart. I, most people like me, I suspect, are not pacifists. Some are noble pacifists. I'm not a pacifist, and I believe in human rights, basic human rights and dignity for everyone at home and abroad. But here's the thing. You've got to have the evidence, and then you've got to be sure that you're going to make things better and not worse. And what happened, I think, with Iraq and, to some extent, Afghanistan is that we got stung because A, we got lied to about the evidence, and B, it was really naffed up, as one of the people said. And we are now understandably cautious, and we don't want that to happen again. And so it's possible that the vote was premature, that recalling Parliament was premature, and, and there may have to be um, a, a further debate. I don't think that Parliament should vote for war on principle. It's got to be the practical reality of whether this is the right moment and whether we'll make it better, not worse. So I think you can't ask for a blank cheque from Parliament, and I don't think that uh, the Prime Minister should rule out possibly in due course going to Parliament again. So do, do you agree with Shami then, Mehdi, that the vote was premature? Oh, it's definitely premature, and that's why I think Damien's being a little bit disingenuous when he says this was not about military action, this was about principles, etc. We all know that David Cameron didn't want to go to Parliament. He didn't want to have two votes. He didn't want to have two votes. And why do we have an emergency vote in Parliament to begin with when the Americans aren't discussing this till next Monday? The French are debating it today, and yet we called back our MPs four days earlier to have a vote on a weekend of airstrikes. The plan was to have airstrikes last weekend. And I think Parliament should be praised for halting this rush to war. I just wish they'd done it 10 years ago and saved hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives. They didn't have this sustained debate. And, and, on, and on Milo's point and Seema's point that we need to do something, I agree. I think everyone in this room thinks we need to do something uh, about the horrible crisis in Syria. The issue is, as the gentleman in the audience pointed out, why is that something 
always become military action in any political and media debate. There's never any discussion about diplomacy, about negotiations, about uh, humanitarian... Actually, today, in Parliament, at PMQs, Ed Miliband and David Cameron actually had a rather constructive discussion about Geneva negotiations, about the role that Iran might play. That, they're having that discussion because Parliament halted a needless rush to war uh, in a hurry without the proper evidence put before Parliament. So I think Parliament should be praised for what it did last week. Uh, Damon, did well, you want to respond uh, yeah, to that? Absolutely. I, I, mean, I glory in the fact, uh, yeah, we all can, that we live in a parliamentary democracy where a government says, should we do this? If Parliament says no, then we don't do it. That's democracy. That's how it's supposed to work. I, th I think it's a bit weird to say, oh, we, we shouldn't have had a parliamentary vote, and then welcome what the parliamentary vote achieved. That's how British democracy is supposed to work. And it did work last week, and, and we will move from there. And the other well, point... Why did we have to have it on Thursday? Absolutely. Why did we have to have it last Thursday? Didn't well, because as, if you have a crisis, then Parliament should be debating it. That's where it's supposed but to the happen. the US Congress, you, the country that's going to lead actions, waiting until next yeah, Monday. And, and also, so why did we have one the, last the, week? The point about evidence is that precisely the evidence was put before Parliament, and Parliament voted the way it did. But, but your, the one point I do agree with you on... Uh, is on uh, the need for diplomacy, and that is happening, and that has been happening for some time, and Britain can continue to play uh, a very constructive role on that. But, and also, I, I return to the point, because I think it's a, the, you know, the central point about this is not about actually what happens to individual politicians or individual political parties in Britain. What matters in this is what happens to the Syrian people, yeah. two million of whom are at this moment refugees, mm -hmm. and what we do to help them seems to be the central discussion that the whole world needs to be having now. Will we be welcoming these refugees to Britain? Minister, will we be welcoming well, any of these refugees to Britain, or will we be putting them on the streets and saying well, they can't use the NHS when they, when well, they find their way to Britain? On, uh, the, the last time this happened, and, and the, the, the line that, oh, this, this is always naffed up, actually Libya two years ago, uh, I would hope everyone in this room uh, welcomes the removal of Gaddafi, and we went in then, no, no, there were some Gaddafi supporters here. Interesting. Um, <laughs> well, I, I should I'm sure the, read, I'm sure read, the, I'm sure read the some black African Libyans who were ethnically read, fenced read, from their villages read, by the militias read, read that we helped take yeah. over. <laughs> 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 Gaddafi. Well, well, Gaddafi was sending troops who were going to massacre the entire population of Benghazi. If we hadn't gone in, there would be Agreed, tens of thousands of dead that's people. What, that's not what so it became, you, though, is it? you that's have to take the responsibility though, if that's, that's what, what you're going to argue. Well, you I, know, I know journalists don't oh, take responsibility for things. Am I responsible for, for what things. happens in foreign countries? No, but you're, in the you're, Congo, you're arguing. Are you responsible for every war that you don't need to be in? You're arguing. You're arguing. You're arguing. You're arguing. Can I answer? You're arguing. Well, you're accusing me of being responsible You're arguing that we should have gone into Libya. And did you? You say a humanitarian no. intervention when Israel was bombing Gaza. If not, you're responsible for all the Palestinian deaths. On that logic, you are. You are. This is an excellent time to go to the power bar it for the really first time. Is. Let's take some time out. It's instant judgment time, so let's find out what the online audience at home make of what you've said so far. Let's see if they agree or disagree with you. Let's fire up the power bar for the first time tonight. And maybe you are in the lead so far. Well done. It could all change. Could all change. Uh, where's Lou Jane? Lou Jane, so you're British but you're of Syrian descent. How are you yeah. feeling about this whole I'm issue? not feeling very happy at all and I don't really feel... I kind of feel ashamed to be British at this moment in time. Um, considering that we know that over 100,000 people have been killed, 2 million people are refugees, and we carry on, we talk about, oh, we are helping, we're helping the refugees. Well, do you know what? The situation's only going to get worse. We've, talk we've talked about, oh, we want to do something, OK, yeah? The political talk that we've been doing for the past three years has not helped. Has it helped? Has it stopped the killing? No, it hasn't. The situation has only escalated. So what other option do we have at this point in time than to go down the route of military intervention? Because if you haven't got another option, the political solution is not working. So what other option have we actually got? Seema. I... I, I totally hear what you're saying but I can't agree with that right now because I don't think we have put enough effort into the peace process now there needs to be a roadmap to peace as well and it is true that the, the, the efforts so far have not succeeded it's also true that the opposition forces have not come to the table but that does not mean that there isn't an opportunity to look to a diplomatic answer to this the only way the war is going to end in Syria is with some kind of political solution you can have a military, military action that makes us feel like we did something but what are you going to do with that 
that if the goals aren't clear? Are you going to really say we're going to wrap the knuckles of a dictator and then just let Syria continue to disintegrate? You have to have something that is bigger than just the military action. Now, what we do know has changed is that undeniable use of chemical weapons. There are still questions to be answered about how and why it happened. And this is going to be a question that the international community has to deal with. But in no way should you read Parliament's vote last week as saying we do not believe that something needs to be done and that we will intervene in whichever way we can. But a military solution was not convincing in terms of the case to say it's going to solve the problem. It could have actually made things so much worse. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to be rude. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry to be rude, but, you know, the, get a lot of platitudes and then a lot of contradictions from, from my right because you know you say well we should, we should have investigated diplomatic solutions and yet you admit that the rebels haven't come to the table I wonder no, how, no, I how, you. Do, how do you, you how do you um, a, I mean what is your strategy for negotiating no, with a brick wall because it's to work, quite difficult a, to negotiate when there's only no, one party I, I disagree with you if a process hasn't worked it doesn't mean that you don't keep going I you, think do, what do, was really no, significant do you agree or do you disagree that the rebels have refused to even contemplate and in any case who would you approach by the way because this is not this is not an organization with a figurehead this is no, a this a, is a coalition a this is a, a, exactly who exactly are you going to negotiate so that is why you need right a different now strategy. nobody even knows who no, that's to why you to. need a different strategy that's why it is right that the foreign secretary is meeting the syrian national coalition You're going to give al-qaeda a call we have, and say no, we have, the debating no we have no Milo, you, if you let me finish what what also happened today was douglas alexander um, the shadow foreign secretary talking about having a syrian contact group now you need a way in which people are going to come to the table and people who are going to be part of that dialogue are given a chance to be part of that dialogue they speak for the majority um, in Syria. I mean, in a sense, you, we need to work out a way that is going to reduce the loss of life going forward and is going to lead to an end to the civil war. It is not convincing that a military your, strike your strategy, without an overall plan is going of, uh, to achieve that. You could make that worse. What would you your do? Your strategy of waiting you has made it worse. Your strategy of waiting strategy. has failed. Your strategy no, of waiting has meant that Assad has used chemical weapons against his the, own people. That's missed, what your strategy of waiting has accomplished. And why, did, no, and, and why did it happen 14 times before last week? I mean, it should have been on the agenda I think much earlier in a way that it, that, it, that it is now but I think what is really significant today is about Russia Russia saying on the eve of the G20 which I think is it really has exposed Russia's position now which was fundamental to solving this crisis saying that there could be some kind of intervention if it's proved about Assad and I think in terms of those who are going to put pressure on Assad and in terms of those who are going to be able to bring the other forces to the table there is a major responsibility in countries that have not taken their responsibility seriously if that has been achieved as a result of last week I think that is something that is we can be proud of and I think we have to keep the pressure on for a diplomatic solution this week through the G20. Okay. Uh, I'd like to speak to some Syrians about this. Where's Murad? Yes. Yes, what do you make of this? Um, what do you make of what you're hearing? By the time when the last chemical weapons were uh, uh, Bashar Assad used it in, uh, in Damascus in the country's side of Damascus uh, till, <coughs> till today it's about more than 2,000 die and he's, he's dil, till now he didn't stop that, uh, killing people, child, women, all, all people. And uh, uh, what, uh, can I just ask you, please, when will be stop Bashar al-Assad, stop the people dying in Syria? When gonna be, he's really stopped. When will be, when, uh, if you remember, if ni from, 19, from 1933 till 1945, and especially from 1941 to 1945, who's about six million Jews die in, in Europe. So do we need this time now to waiting for about six million Syrian people die now? Do, do we need to, to wait for this six million? Damien. Uh, well, I, I mean, that's, that's the central question. What can we do uh, to, to stop it happening? And it's easy to get emotional. I get emotional about it because I get really angry uh, and, and horrified at the sight of of, of babies and children who've been attacked by chemical weapons, any human being, any you know, reasonable human being would. I think the, uh, the one point I, I would make about uh, any kind of, of military strike, and, and it's not an invasion but a military strike, is that that would put uh, pressure on Assad and in particular he would know that it's not a cost-free option, that continuing to kill his own people, as he has done, has consequences for him and for his armed forces. And, and when what I, th he, one, when I think, can, can I finish? One of the, the powerful arguments, I think, uh, that was made in favor uh, of the proposal last week that was defeated was precisely that, that if we don't do this, then it is all words, that there is no pressure on Assad, and all the evidence is he will carry on killing if he thinks he can get away with it. So, should there be another vote, Damien? 
Well, let's, I mean, we've said that there's, there's not point having another vote until the circumstances, unless the circumstances uh, change very radically. And I think, I think that's, uh, that's the sensible way forward. You have a vote in Parliament I'm, and you have to respect that. I've never, I've never understood this logic that Bashar al-Ashad uh, is a monster. We all agree on that. He's a dictator. We're comparing him to Adolf Hitler. Uh, he's a very evil man. He uses chemical weapons against his own people. He's this horrible, evil dictator. But if we spend a weekend dropping some bombs on him, he'll immediately start doing what he's told. I just don't buy that logic. The more likely outcome is that he ratchets up his own violence against civilians. And then what do we do? If he fires chemical weapons again, do we bomb him again? Do we turn it into a weekly event since you've ruled out a ground invasion. So what would you do? Well, either you either have the honesty to say we're going to go in, invade, remove him from power, not something I support, but at least it's a consistent position, or you say you take a diplomatic route, you call for a ceasefire as a way to reduce civilian casualties. But this halfway house where you drop some bombs over a weekend and think that that will stop a dictator from using everyone, where's the evidence for that, that he will suddenly cower and come running and say, well, I won't do anything again because you dropped a missile on me on Saturday night? You see, I think this is important. There's nothing that I have heard in this debate so far this evening that makes me think that anybody's speaking in bad faith or that anybody's got dubious motives. This is, this is really hard. And, and, and yes, the evidence is emerging of what atrocities um, you know, ha have happened. I don't think the evidence base is, is a problem here as perhaps it was with Iraq, but there's also the practicality and you have to, and, and you have to get both right. And there are atrocities right. only on one uh, side. And there are atrocities only on one side and, and, and what Mehdi I think is now alluding to is might we make it worse or might we not make it better and that's really, pain that's really painful to admit sometimes when you won't necessarily be able to make things better and you're watching those pictures on the news night after night but, but nonetheless I I think that if you look at public opinion, if you look at some of the polling, people are worried about being stung again on both fronts, either that they're being lied to, I think they're not being lied to this time is my own view for what it's worth, but they also don't want to find themselves embroiled in a foreign war, blood and treasure, sending young people like you lot off to war uncertain consequences and maybe we don't make it better so that's why I think Seema's point about bringing new countries around the table because part of making it better and not making it worse is about saying it's not just Britain and America this time that there's going to be genuine multilateralism in the international community countries that we don't talk to like Iran might have to start facing up to their responsibilities on the world stage and yes in the meantime you're talking and people are dying and that's so painful but in the end I think sometimes there is no choice. Uh, yes, this gentleman here. As an Afghan, I can see the, the, comp uh, the compromise, the similarities between Syria and Afghanistan because Russia was supporting Afghanistan in the 1980s and then the similar thing was happening, the Mujahideen was supported by the Americans and there was a civil war afterwards. I, I do not support any military intervention, but on the other hand, we cannot allow Assad killing his own people for years and years, and it's more than enough that he killed over 100,000 people. Whether he killed it by a chemical weapon or whether he just killed it, it's a murder. He's killing his people. But we should not forget who gave those chemical weapons to Syria. There's a report and evidence that the UK actually allowed this chemical weapon to go to Syria, the Department for Business and Innovation. And also, we are forgetting to talk about um, uh, Egypt because Americans are giving money to the Egyptian military to kill its own people, and we say nothing. Yep. How about what are we going to do about Afghanistan? Uh, gentlemen, next to in the yellow T-shirt. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's been countless polls um, in the media uh, about whether the UK government should take military action against Syria, and the overwhelming majority of public opinion is that no, um, we shouldn't uh, go there and take military action. Considering David Cameron likes to brand the Syrian government as a regime that goes against the will of its own people, if the UK government does take action against Syria and does invade, can we brand the UK government as a regime that goes against the will of the British people? Should we, Damien? Well, that's why we have a parliament in this country. We had a parliamentary vote. Parliament said no, so we're not taking military action. That, that's how democracy works, that's how it should work. But I'm not convinced that the... That, that, that I, I agree with you about the polling, and I, and I think we can tell from even people in this room that people are very, very concerned about military action, very cautious, and I share that caution. But I don't think that people are pacifists on principle. I don't think that public opinion is such 
as to suggest that, that people would never go to war in Syria or they would never uh, you'd go for humanitarian you're intervention You're absolutely again. right that the well has been poisoned, right? There's, yeah. It's almost like the government's cried wolf too many times and now when there really is a clear case, the public aren't behind but that it. But that right. doesn't mean uh, well, that the as the picture... Well, I think the public not a clear case. Yeah. I think the public are well, ahead of some of the politicians here and are they, asking they, questions really that politicians that. aren't asking. So what do we do the day after we drop exactly. a bomb? What do we exactly. do the day after Al-Qaeda takes over some town without help? What are all these and questions... And that's all common that, sense. That we're not know. asked in the Commons. We're not put, sorry, we're not answered by the government in the Commons. And well, I think that's what contributed I, to the defeat. I think that's slightly unfair because what everyone in, in the Commons was given, and I'm, I'm quite surprised that there's, there hasn't been more uh, media coverage of it, was uh, the intelligence reports because uh, that's, that's our best intelligence. No, no, and David, 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 that's about the, that's about the chemicals. I'm talking about the plan. No, no, plan. No, 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 I mean, David Cameron made the point, um, as a stark contrast to Tony Blair of Iraq, he said, am I telling you 100% that I can be sure that um, Assad dropped those chemical weapons. No, you can't be. Damien. And we can't be absolutely sure. Damien, the overwhelming evidence is that that's the case, but, but we can't actually be sure. Respect, now, that's an honest debate that you can have in, with, in good faith, respect, it seems to me. The chemical weapons issue is almost a red herring. It's killed less than 1% of the 100,000 Syrians who have died. Are we saying if Assad doesn't use chemical weapons, no. it's fine? It's the very, only it's issue that... Very clear. The only chemical issue, weapons, very clear. Uh, Obama fine, has said this. Fine, chemical fine, weapons he used chemical because, weapons. Because chemical agree, weapons are not... I agree, as, you, as, you, as you all know, you know you're, chemical you're, weapons are not an instrument of war. The point is not whether you use chemical weapons. The point is, does dropping bombs make the situation better or worse? Does it bring the war to a close quicker or more slowly and some of us think it makes the war run much longer it exacerbates the problem on the ground regardless of whether he used chemical weapons or not the only issue is is bombing the right course of action well, well chemical weapons are straightforwardly illegal that's yeah. the issue about that chemical weapons true. have been oh, for right. because they are and, and unique, I, wish, I wish the Tory horrible. government had done something in 1988 when Saddam was gassing his people with the with, when they turned a blind eye to that too with right. that, about red uh, yeah you. I'm gonna take a question for this gentleman here yeah yeah um, I've got a question for Seema and Mehdi Chemical weapons have been illegal for 100 years. Uh, Obama drew a red line about two and a half to three years ago. When does diplomacy stop? When does... Diplomacy stop? When I would we turn the question on working? its head. I would say, when does diplomacy start? We haven't had a peace conference in over a year. Damien's shaking his head. When was the last peace conference? Chemical so, weapons we, we, have been we illegal for 100 years. We've been doing negotiations years. all the time. When was the last peace conference you, 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 on Syria, answer, David? Answer his question. Well, you don't turn on its head. Chemical, chemical answer, weapons have been illegal because, for 100 because years. Because you can't answer his question. If you don't... I'll answer his question. OK. And I'll answer your laugh as well. There hasn't been a peace conference in over a year. The Geneva Peace Conference, Geneva 2, was scheduled for the summer. The Americans postponed it twice, in June and in August. That is a fact. You can go and look that up. And the fact about diplomacy is, look, I'm not saying diplomatic solution is a good solution. There are no good solutions in Syria. My only point is this. Do you do something to pour fuel on the fire or pour water on the fire? I would try and pour water on the fire. It may not put the fire out, but it's better than pouring fuel on the fire. Okay. What are people at home saying, Tina? They're getting very heated at home as well. Frank says, surely Assad being deposed would just introduce more tension and the leader who would replace him could very possibly be worse. Um, Shanice says, it's inhumane for us to sit and watch this happen. Why did we go to Iraq? Oil, money, we need to get our priorities right. And this one from Jack, who says, surely as a global power, it's our responsibility to help the people of Syria, even without the use of chemical weapons. Probably a good time to see what's happening with the power bar at the moment to see if anything's changed. Mehdi's still in the lead. Shamit, you are catching up and Milo and Damien struggling for popularity, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, Ore, where's Ore? I don't think that's changed. Ah, you've got a question. Okay, um, has the UK gone down, um, has the UK gone down in the world's estimation after deciding not to intervene in Syria? I hate that question. Forgive me, I don't hate you, but I really hate that question yeah. <laughs> because I don't give a monkey's about all this nonsense about how you look on the world stage. If this is... Like, I don't give a... No, I really don't. I really don't. I really don't. No, I really don't. You know that, it, you know no. that our international reputation oh, no. affects our ability to negotiate for peace. It affects all sorts of things. Our standing in the world isn't just a question of who we can get to go, you know, to, to well, launch planes with us, but you know perfectly well, well I'm not that our standing in the world affects our ability to peacefully well, advocate Well, then I agree with the minister. Well, in that case, I will, if, if that's the case, I will agree with the minister that our standing as the oldest unbroken democracy on earth okay. is not undermined by having a parliamentary debate and having a vote and respecting it. So there may be another vote in the future. The picture so, may change, but I am never going to say that our standing as a great democracy is affected also, by having democracy and respecting it. Also, if, 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 if winning a global league table on popularity requires bombing countries, then that's not a league table I want to be at the top of. I mean, let's do... 
I, as Shami said, I'd much rather be admired for our democracy, by our vote in the Commons, by the fact that ministers and MPs come here to talk to the public, uh, for our aid budget, for our action on climate change. I would actually argue that our role in the world, our status has probably gone up after last week, because let's be honest, forget what foreign governments think, what do foreign peoples think around the world? Our standing was damaged heavily by our involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq and our turning of a blind eye to human rights abuses by our yeah. friends, let alone our enemies. Yes. That's what damages our standing in the world, not whether we're you know, uh, going to go to war with whatever American government decides to do at whatever time or whatever weekend. I don't think that should be or is a factor. I agree. Seema. I actually have to agree with Shami on this one. I, I think it was so important to go through uh, that process last week. All the questions can remain about whether it was right to recall on Thursday, whether we could have waited till today and all of those questions. I'm, I'm just going to put those aside because what's happened has happened. And I think if this has actually put the suffering of the Syrian people much more centre stage in a way that I think it should have been for far longer, yeah. then I think that's actually been a really good outcome. And I am proud, actually, of Britain in terms of actually putting the debate on the table about what's the right way forward. Can you actually strive for a process for peace and can you actually strive for a ceasefire even if it's against the odds and could that actually make a bigger difference than going to war right now and I, I do feel proud of that conversation I don't think it has d diminished Britain's role in the world maybe we are in a slightly different phase now where we're actually saying there can be a greater diversity a different way, number of ways in which you can make interventions let's have that conversation let's continue to work let's continue to look at the evidence but most of all let's keep focused on Syria and what's going to be the best way to end this civil war. Would you agree with that, David? Well, I, I agree with a lot of that, and I think the straight answer to the question is it's too early to tell. It depends what we do now. Uh, and, and I agree with everyone who said what's much more important is what happens to the Syrian people than, than, than what happens to uh, our reputation. But it will change. If we continue to play uh, a constructive role in this crisis and in other crises, and if we learn from mistakes in the past, like the lies Blair told about Iraq, then our standing in the world uh, will go up in the long run. And, and it does matter uh, what our standing in the world is because if, if we are uh, a voice that people listen to because we're a democracy, because we have freedoms, because we have free speech, um, then that's good because the more the world is like that, then the happier place the world is. Uh, let's have a couple of uh, online comments, well, please, Well, we've Tina. got this one that's coming. Lots of people online are talking about the UK's special relationship with America. James says, we need to stand by the US. Plus, the UK still has a role in the world to protect innocent people being killed by tyrants. Intervene, so America and Britain should stick together. OK. Uh, so, tonight in Washington, the Foreign Relations Panel has approved military action against Syria. This is what President Obama said about Syria today. But I think America also recognizes that um, if the international community fails to maintain certain norms, standards, laws governing how countries interact and how people are treated, uh, that over time this world becomes less safe. Okay, so that's what President Obama says. Uh, yes, lady here. We're sitting here, we're talking of a possible war that can be happening, but we're forgetting that there's actually a war going on inside Syria. And then we talk about chemical weapons and we talk about the evidence, when really, like, you've seen it all on TV. I don't understand what evidence we need. And then you've got people dying in, like, the most brutal ways. And all we can talk about is chemical weapons. I don't understand why it's taken us two years and a half to realise that, you know, maybe the red line should be drawn for chemical weapons when really this is the 14th time that chemical weapons have been used. And then you, you have to understand that there's really brutal methods of killing and slaughtering in Syria. You've got like uh, the government, you know, like stabbing knives in people's necks and leaving them to die. But then all of a sudden chemical weapons is a red line. I don't understand why chemical weapons is a red line and other sort of killing isn't a red line. Um, you, it's just, you know, like, this red line that we've drawn is just, it, it has no basis, really. Sort of echoing what Maddie said earlier, I think. Uh, lady in the yellow dress. I want to re-ask the question, I want to ask the re -ask the question that was asked to the Defence Minister in Parliament after, the day after the vote got passed through. Um, it was asked by the Labour MP and it was scoffed at. Under what circumstances would Britain be prepared to re-look at this vote and when, uh, under what circumstances could it go back into Parliament a second time? Okay, Damien. Uh, and Philip Hammond's reply was that if, if there was a significant change 
uh, in the situation. And, and oddly enough, I think for, for all the arguments, actually there's, there's quite a lot of consensus um, around that, that uh, whether it was, it's, it's new evidence of bad behavior or new evidence of, of what's already gone, it would have to be uh, a significant change rather than, you know, we, we don't want Parliament to keep returning and have the same debate again and again. I don't, I don't think that would, that would help anyone. But it could also be new evidence on the practicalities and the, and, and the potential effectiveness of action. It could be new evidence about other diplomatic um, and, and international conversations that are working or not working so that there's more of a plan. It could be evidence there's greater international support for, and there's all sorts of things that could change. And I think it would be, forgive me, Minister, it would be a mistake to say we will not go back to Parliament when we're all saying that it was a good thing that, 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 that there is debate in Parliament. Right, I'm going to have to go uh, and find out what people are saying online yeah, from you, please, lots Tina. Lots of people are talking online. Um, we've got this one from Jamie, who says, despite what people say, we still have the military resources to help civilians. It should be proportionate, though. Uh, David says, politically, as a world power, we have a duty with international partners to make sure countries adhere to international laws. Uh, and this from Rufus, who says, surely, in this day and age, it should be an international decision made through the UN. That's what the UN is for, isn't it? Let's have a look at the power bar to see what's happening. Mehdi, you were leading at the beginning of this debate, and Shami's catching up, so you're about neck and neck. Damien Milo still struggling, I'm afraid. You can influence the power bar too. Get on Twitter right now and tell our panellists what you think of them. You can use hashtag yes or hashtag no, followed by their first name. Make your voice heard on free speech by tweeting the power bar. OK, uh, it's been the first time that people have had their say on television about Syria. Thanks for all of your comments. Now we're going to change subject uh, for a big issue here in Hackney. Stop and search, one of the most controversial ways that the police combat crime. Controversial because black people are seven times more likely to be stopped and searched than white. And of one million searches last year, only 9% led to an arrest. The Home Office is running a public consultation this month. In Hackney, stop and search numbers are falling, but for many people, still a cause for concern. Here's Kenny's story. My name is Kenny, and I'm 19 years old. I was born and raised in Hackney. I'm a civil servant working in financial services. Oh, Hackney is a nice place. You know, it's better. It's very vibrant. It obviously still has its ups and downs. The relationship between police and youth is not at its best. I couldn't even tell you the amount of times I used to get stopped to search. It brought me to distress. I don't agree to be stopped to search numerous amount of times just because of the clothes you're wearing, or I'm in a certain area, or maybe even the colour of my skin. It wasn't fair, and I didn't want other people to feel the pain I felt. So I thought it was time for a voice to be heard. At Hackney Community and Voluntary Service, we have a monitoring group, Stop and Search monitoring group. Yeah, I'm doing good now, how are you? We talk about how Stop and Search affects the community. What will give you greater confidence in police use of Stop and Search? When I'm being stopped in public, I was annoyed because people are looking at me and they've got their mindset that you're a criminal just because the police are stopping you. OK, so tell me about it. What happened? Well, basically, a police car pulled up outside the front of my house and he was like, are you lost, mate? And I was like, whoa, what? are you lost? And then he was like, oh, you know, we look suspicious around this area at this time. I mean, I live in a predominantly white area, so I'm just thinking, I can see where this is going, man. Yeah. Stop and search should be more intelligence-led to get guns and knives off the street rather than just stopping a lot of people and just kind of aggravating them. A lot more needs to be done. And just before we take a question, I'd like to bring in Matthew Horn, uh, who is the borough commander for Hackney. What would you say to Kenny, Matthew? I'd say to Kenny that the great work that's been done by the management group has helped us bring stop and search and the amount of times we use it down. We've halved the use of stop and search here. You saw the national figures there, but in Hackney it's a very different picture as it is across London. We've halved the use of stop and search. We've doubled nearly the amount of times what we would say is a positive outcome. So somebody's arrested. I think we're listening. We are on a bit of a journey. We're not always going to get it right, but we get it right more times than we don't. So last year we arrested 5,000 more people than the year before as a result of stop and search. It's an incredible, useful power. It has to be used properly and proportionately. And above all, my goodness, does it have to be used with respect and politeness. And that's where I believe we've got a lot, lot better. We're not there yet. We really aren't. We have got a long way to go, but my goodness, have we improved. And I think the work that we've done with people like Kenny on the monitoring group has been a big contributing factor to the way 
that we sit here now. And the last thing I'd say is that the vast majority of people that engage in stop and search, and every public meeting I go to, it rises, most people want the power to stay. We welcome the government's consultation. We think it's a great idea. Most people want it to stay, but they do want us to get better at it, and they do want us to be polite and treat people with respect, and they're absolutely right to expect that. Okay. Uh, Kenny, you've got a question. Yes. Is stop and search helping or hurting the community? Okay. Uh, Damien, you're the policing minister, so we'll start with you. Is stop and search helping or harming communities? Uh, if, it's, if it's used badly... Uh, then it can harm. As, as the, the, the commander just said, it's, it's a useful tool for the police. Um, if the alternative is just arresting everyone you're a bit suspicious of, then far more people will be arrested. Nobody wants to see that. But clearly, uh, looking at the figures, the figures you said, you know, you're seven times more likely to be stopped and searched if you belong to an ethnic minority. That's wrong. That must be wrong. Um, that only 9% lead to arrest. And, and beyond that figure, behind that figure, is, a, is an even more interesting and worrying one, which is the percentage that lead to arrest is enormously variable between different police forces around the country. We've got 43 different police forces, and it ranges from about 3 uh, up into 30 40%. So clearly, some police forces are much better at using it than others, uh, and the Met has indeed uh, got a lot better, but there's a, a hell of a lot more to do. That's why we're holding this public, uh, public consultation. And also, uh, direct interest, I suspect, to a lot of people here, we've extended it. It was going to be six weeks. It's now running uh, till September the 24th, so there's still time uh, for people to take part in this consultation. Uh, and you know, we want to keep the stop and search power, but absolutely we want it to be used better than it has in the past and used in a way that actually promotes community cohesion, community respect and so on, uh, rather than in a way it's too often been used in the past. Uh, Shami, do you welcome this public consultation about stop and search? I, I certainly welcome the consultation, but I want to be clear, this is a lot easier than Syria. The law needs to be tightened up. I do not accept that the current powers of stop and search are useful. I think they are poisonous. I think they are poisoning communities. They, there are young men that I meet in schools, particularly in inner London and other inner cities, whose first engagements with the police are through stop and search, and it is, it is, it is um, poisoning far more people than it's ever protecting. Now, here's the thing. There are two kinds of stop and search that I will approve of. One is the kind of stop and search power that you experience when you go to the airport or when you go to Parliament and everybody is being stopped and searched because it's such a high security place that everybody understands they're not picking on me because I'm black or I'm a man or because I'm a human rights campaigner. Everybody's going through security. That's fair enough. People understand the proportionality of doing that, for example, at the airport or when you go to visit your MP. The second kind of stop and search, which I will approve of, is stop and search based on on reasonable suspicion that you have committed an offence or you might be going to commit an offence. But that's not the powers that we're talking about. That's not the powers that, are, that have been abused and been so divisive. We're talking about powers that the police have to designate an area for stop and search without suspicion. And what then happens in those areas is that the power is used in an arbitrary and inevitably a discriminatory way and it's young black men who are having their lives um, um, poisoned and their experience of authority and policing and community cohesion poisoned by a power that never captures a criminal. You, you, you say that occasionally people get, get charged. How many of those people get convicted? Yeah. Um, this, this is a, the law needs to be credit to the officer and credit to the police who have understood in recent years that um, these powers are too broad and they've self-censored, they've started using the power less, but the power needs to be tightened up and I call on the Minister and on SEMA, these are legislators, to tighten up those powers so they're based on reasonable suspicion and aren't capable of being used in such an <coughs> arbitrary, poisonous and discriminatory way. Okay, uh, yeah, this lady here in the red. I'd just like to point the question to you. As Conservatives, you believe that if you're young, if you are black, <coughs> if you wear a hoodie, that you are a thief. And we've seen that no, continue no, to happen. No, you're stating statistics, but you haven't made a change. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe you should go to that referral and look at alternative methods, because stop and search is degrading as a human mm -hmm. being. But to think that, that you look like a thief is a slap in the face. And this, government, and this government is endorsing that. They are not changing that. David Cameron does not care if, that, if you're walking down the street and you're wearing a hoodie, if you're black, if you're young. He doesn't care. What, what does he know? 
What does he know? Tell me. Uh, that's this. Can I just, can I just say to the yeah. lady in the audience, can I just come in and defend uh, Damien on this? It is, to be fair to him, it is his government and a Conservative Home Secretary who have called for this review into this. And the record the rise in stops and searches happened on the CMUS party with Labour Home Secretaries change. posturing, trying nothing's to look tough change. on crime. Right. Trying to look tough on crime. What was it Tony Blair once said? I asked the police what powers they want and I give it to them. That's true. And that's what happened on no, 165% rise in stops and searches. None of you looked at alternatives. Which government? has looked at alternatives rather than stopping and searching. This one. And the that's what we're doing now. No, but you're not doing anything. That's fine. Even I, after this, you're not going to stop someone. We're in someone. the middle of a consultation. It, really it was started in July. It's going to end Young in three weeks' time. Contribute to the consultation, Young people don't please. feel safe in your government. People who wear hoodies don't feel safe in your government, and that should not be. We are voting you in, and you don't listen. You two are going to talk afterwards. Uh, yes, <laughs> this gentleman here in the cap. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that we're, we're kind of all getting the whole thing totally misunderstood, because at the end of the day, the police are operating on stereotypes and stereotypes are set by the media um, it's what we call a moral panic now part of me doesn't necessarily blame police but for the simple fact that they're going off of maybe their own um, stereotypical views that they've grown up with and then the stereotypical views that are portrayed in the media so I think what we need to do to improve stop and search is first initially challenge the perception of young black men especially because <laughs> if you go to google right now and write in police stop and search the first five pages are all black men get stop and search i've done it today before i came in just to see <laughs> the first five pages on google images do it and then you get a chance to do it young black men getting stopped to search so that in itself is a problem that already yeah, means that the internet, even the internet believes that <laughs> look, this stop and is them, it's them. So until we can challenge the negative stereotypes that are supported by the media, supported by where people come from, we're going to continue to be in this negative cycle can where at the end of the day, the police are just a representation yeah. of the society. <laughs> and if the society as a whole believes that young black men in particular, are the ones that are causing problems and it's such I, think, a I think we're all going to want to respond. I think it's we're all going to want to respond. It's an issue this. of perception. Um, I mean, let's let's start with an unpopular point. What some people call stereotypes, other people might call statistical fact. I mean, it is simply true. Oh, please, hello. Where? Where? It's, 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 it's simply true that certain crimes are overwhelmingly committed by certain profiles of, of people. What we need to fix, what we need, what we need to fix is is, is education. And there, we need to do some really serious systemic work to support communities in underprivileged areas in the country. But let's not forget that, that, that you know, we do need at the same time to find a balance to, to protect the victims of crime as well. I'm not supporting these indiscriminate stop and search things. But you know, if when we get caught up and carried away with this idea of like, you know, media scare stories, you know, that goes a little bit far. And it, and it simply is true to say that certain crimes are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly committed by certain groups. Well, so shall we have powers? To, shall we have powers to only arrest men and not arrest? We, we no, can't, but, this is, but you see, this no. is actually the opposite of racism because no, when you no, because this look, isn't, it, this isn't the way to approach This is not law. Well. You know, Martin, I, I agree with the young man, by the way, who said, you know, we've got to challenge stereotypes, but but the law is still important, and these powers are far too broad. Martin Luther King famously said, you know, um, I, you know, the law won't make you love me, but I can change the law to stop you lynching me. And these powers are too broad, and it's not even the police's fault. We should have stop and search powers that are triggered by reasonable suspicion that somebody has committed an offence or is about to be committing an offence. We should not have these very broad, loose powers to stop anybody you like because they live on that council estate. That is not good enough for people in their country estate and that's not good enough for people on inner city uh, estates in my city either. Well, so if, if, you, if you agree or disagree with anything that's being said, get in touch uh, with Tina. What yeah, are people Paul saying at home? just that and has a reply for you, Milo. Paul will believe stop and search is fair when squad cars stop suits in the city and search laptops for tax evasion. <laughs> I wouldn't, okay. have a problem yeah, with, on, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem with that for the same reason I don't have a problem with racial profiling at airports. I don't have a problem with cer certain kinds of stop and search. And I, I, I would be delighted to see some of these guys pulled over on their laptop search I as well. Got to this gentleman wants to respond to that. Yeah, the reason I wanted to respond to him, and, and why I'm saying it's a moral panic, is simple. Young people are responsible for less than 12% of all violent crime in the last 
in last year's um, police statistics. So if, we're less, if they're responsible for less than 12 per cent, but the media spends 60 per cent of its time talking about it, obviously people are going to believe that the situation is worse than it actually is. Yeah. Fair point. Uh, yes, gentlemen over here in the blue shirt. I'm really looking forward to seeing my next popularity bar after that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask how many times you've been stopped, because I can tell you I've never been stopped. I've never been stopped. And the young man's point was that it's a vicious cycle. That's exactly what he's no, saying. No, I mean, like, you know, I, I, I travel a great deal. I've been stopped at, I've been stopped at airports recently. <laughs> Have you been stopped and searched? I've been stopped at airports twice. Not at airports. Don't get into a game of who's been stopped more at airports out of the two of us, I can assure you. Look, but, have you been stopped and searched in a, in a city area by no, police? No, no, no. In the way you know, there is a major issue. There is a, there is a major issue. I, I mean, you get what you talk about what the what the gentleman is talking about there in terms of you know the bias that creeps in, the perception of whole communities, I think is incredibly dangerous. You know, not just for Britain, but you know, for social cohesion, for the opportunities for young people. You hear story after story of, a, of someone who ends up feeling totally violated with the way that they've been treated. And it totally affects their confidence, totally affects their relationship with the police. I mean, Labour has welcomed this consultation as well. I have to say that I stood up and asked the Home Secretary on that day in, in July why we weren't having a longer consultation, and she responded to me saying it was long enough. And then three weeks later, the government changed its mind, which was quite right, but quite right, because how can you have a consultation on something as important as this when everyone's about to go on summer holidays? I think actually what we need to be doing is saying, what is it that's going to make something like this far more effective? What is it that the police need to do? You cannot have a system like stop and search that you think is going to produce the results. There were 1.2 million uh, stop and searches last year. 45,000 arrests, that's not even the number that were then charged, which was far exactly. less than that. I mean, the statistics are incredible. Yeah. And what you need to be looking at... But you're no, a legislator, no, what, no, what you need Change to be looking at. Time what, you, Sammy, what you need Sammy to be looking at. I'm just going to finish, no, finish, finish, finish this point. No, I'm just going to finish. I'm just going to finish this point, Betty. I'm just going to. I'm just going to finish this point. I'm just going to finish this point. And all of that obviously needs looking at, but I'm just going to finish this point, which is there is a major issue about the diversity of the police force as well. The police forces that are not connected to communities, that do not understand communities. If you have national police force that is a 5% ethnic minority, in London 10% ethnic minority, it is not surprising that you do not have the connection to the yeah. communities that we need. And that is the big shift that we also need to make. Sure, I want to talk to Aaron quickly. Where, where's Aaron? So Aaron, you've developed a, an app that has a practical application to do with stop and search. Explain what it is. So basically, it lets the public know what their rights are in a really clear and easy to understand way when they get stopped and searched. Like a lot of your rights, when you go on the web and try and research what your rights are, it's really long and it's not clear and straight to the point. So we've come up with the top 10 things the public want to know about their stop and search rights that they can use in a practical situation when they're getting stopped and searched to basically empower them in that situation to move in an informative way, you know, in a, make an informed decision on how they're you know, addressing the issue. And then the second part of the app is basically the upload your experience section. So it basically allows you to feedback on how your stop and search was carried out. So that's basically the, your details, the ID number of the officer, um, if the procedure was carried out in the correct way, and it geolocates it to the exact point where you are stopped and searched. It's a fantastic idea, isn't it? It's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Uh, we've, got to go to, uh, yes. we've got to go to Tina and wrap things up online. We have to go straight to the power bar. Milo, your popularity is shot right yeah. back. Mehdi, you want to stop. seconds goes to the panellists with the most support overall. Mehdi, that's you. 30 seconds over to you. Uh, what I would say to you all is we are in a very, very dangerous place right now. Uh, we may or may not go, the West may or may not go to war in Syria. Uh, Come back to the main issue that we talked about in this programme is the reason I turned up, and that is don't accept uh, what politicians or journalists tell you who say there's nothing else we can do but more war, more war, more war. There's always, always an alternative to war, especially in the current climate where we have such a, such a complicated situation. Don't accept any simplistic solutions, please. Thank you very much. That is almost it. Thank you to our audience, to our panel, and to you at home for sending in your comments. The debate continues online. Join us next time live on October 9th in Cambridge. But in the meantime, let's return to our main topic tonight, Syria, and an exclusive free speech interview with a young woman in Damascus who doesn't want to be identified, but she does want us to know what life is like there for young people. Life is pretty difficult. Uh, if we are not getting shelled ourselves, that means we, we can't sleep because of the sound of shelling other areas. 
Children are crying all the time. They are always afraid. They can't sleep because they feel that it might be their turn to get killed. They don't feel safe. They lost members of their families. It's not life. In the mosque center, you have to pass by many checkpoints. You might get uh, arrested out of sudden uh, like that, even if you are not an activist and even if you don't participate in the revolution. I need to stay here. I have to stay here and to help people here and to help my country.